Glad to know you're still there for this joining the conversation. You've missed a lot, but yes, we still have more to go. Uh, you, this is a news help showing live on Silverbird Television, Silverbird News 24. Um, in the last segment, we talked about the oil issues going on around the oil crisis and uh, of course, the second line job. But this time around, we're still focusing on the economy. Economy. We're talking about uh, the FX crisis, uh, the FX scarcity, and all that comes with it. Uh, you want to buy something from the market. I was speaking with David earlier. You want to buy something from the market as small as Gary, or even tomato, or even onion. And they'll tell you, ah, in Yoruba, they'll say, dollar, timo, meaning it's not expensive to get dollars. And you're asking yourself, what has dollar got to do with tomato or onion? We might be able to find out at some point on the show today. So we're talking today about... Um, FX scarcity and the impact on the real sector. Kevin Emanuel joins us all the way uh, from, uh, yeah, from Zoom World. Yeah, he joins us virtually. Uh, Kevin Emanuel is uh, a financial analyst. Thank you for joining us this morning, Kelvin. Good morning. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Great, great to have you as well. Uh, I, I, I wished I could get to see your face clearly, but I think your white shirt is, is, is making you a bit more visible to us. So if you have any lights in front of you, I don't mind pushing it in your direction so we can get to see you. Uh, I'll see your face well for aesthetic purposes. But maybe I should start with what you think is the... Um, uh, what do you think dollar is selling for today? Because that's, that's, the, f that's the first thing anybody's going to ask you uh, before they ask you where they are going to find the dollar in the first place to get. Uh, well, the only market that um, is liquid right now is the parallel market and is somewhere between 690 and 693. It did drop like um, 10 days ago to somewhere around 645 to 650 and then it's pulled back up and it's going back to 700 and you know these are issues that a lot of a lot of people um who are economists in nigeria have consensus on on the way forward uh, but it's very obvious it's very obvious that the government um believes that as the regime it is strong, which is subsidized and have a huge differential between the official markets and the IE window and the parallel markets is the way to go. So the cycle continues and there's a huge difference between the parallel market and the official market, which is today as we speak somewhere around um, um, 269 by USD and which is really creating a lot of crisis for multinational companies in Nigeria. Each crisis this is causing for virtually every player within the Nigerian economy, and not just the multinationals. Even the, the real sectors in Nigeria are bleeding, bleeding really, really badly. We've seen the manufacturing sectors asking for uh, fresh FX um, interventions. We also uh, can look at what's going down within the aviation sector, inability to repatriate just because um, government doesn't have, uh, the central bank doesn't seem to have uh, to give them uh, to repatriate their funds back. So it is indeed a huge crisis within uh, the real sector of the economy. Um, Kelvin, help us understand exactly how we got to where we are that um, we can't even afford to allow our multinationals uh, repatriate their funds? So basically, um, the central bank governor does not, the central bank of Nigeria does not print US dollars. US dollars is simply settlements that the CBN does from its current account balance for its balance of trade. And the sources for FX for any central bank usually for Nigeria is remittances, number one. Number two, certificate of capital imports, number two. Number three, the revenues in royalties the NMPC gets, yes. And number four, NXP proceeds from companies who export. These are the sources of FX for the central bank of Nigeria. Now, let's take FDIs, for example. You can see that within the last seven years, the level of foreign direct investments has dropped. And today, as we speak, the, FA, the FDI flows to Nigeria is less than a billion dollars. And I, I keep telling, I keep saying it, that look, the solution to the government attracting FDIs, which is the most stable uh, after 
um, the royalties that the NMPC earns from crude oil is PSC contracts for crude oil, is not giving concessions on and waivers to companies who want to set up in Nigeria. Take the example of the situation with Emirates Airlines and the situation with the other international airlines you have in Nigeria. They have 450 million US dollars they need to repatriate as profits to their foreign treasury operations. Yeah. They are unable to do so because the central bank is unwilling to provide them with the FX at the official window that they need. And here's why I sympathize with Emirates Airlines, for example, that has, by the way, decided that by the 1st of September, if there is no intervention, which is not a good precedent, by the way, because when you have to look for a political solution to a purely policy problem, it's a very negative sign for any serious investor to come in. Okay? Here's why I sympathize with them. So say they have said Emirates sold those tickets, and when they sold those tickets in Naira, they hedged USD at 425 or 430 Naira. How do you expect the airline to now go to the parallel market to buy FX at 690, which is somewhere at about 62 or 63 um, percent uh, um, inflation in rates? What that simply means is that Emirates has wiped off any profit that is earning considering that the price of aviation fuel has really gone up globally. That's what it simply means. Emirates has wiped up any profits it's made in internal rate of return in Nigeria because of the issues around foreign exchange instability in Nigeria. So why would Emirates airline have to take a hit in profits, which is an external risk it doesn't have any control over because of the vagaries and the inconsistencies of the Nigerian government? These are the issues. So when you don't have enough FX coming in from FDIs because companies are not able to price risk, FX coming in from NMPC for royalties on this production sharing contract with the IOCs, and it's coming in from, uh, sorry, inflows coming in from certificate of capital imports for companies who are good, which have used um, FDIs too, and then remittances, yeah? And when you have demand for FX higher than the supply of FX, that becomes a problem. Absolutely. Um, it actually does uh, become a problem, Kelvin. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are about how the policies that have been set so far, um, say by the CBN, has helped either worsen or uh, help make the situation better. Well, well, I can't say make the situation better. We can see the situation better because we can see the handwriting on the wall. It's really very clear. So what are the somewhat unfriendly policies that you've seen so far that you, you would suggest um, there should be a change to? First of all, the central bank government owes the CBN Act, the act that establishes the CBN, a fiduciary responsibility that the Senate of Nigeria should hold the government in contempt of for violating by asking the federal government to comply with the Ways and Means Lending Act of 2007 that says the federal government is not allowed by law to borrow the federal government more than the CBN is not allowed by law to borrow, borrow the federal government more than five percent um, in loans or overdrafts, temporary overdraft, which is a one-year overdraft, really, or more than five percent of his um, real GDP for the previous accounting year, which is typically called ways and means lending. That's number one because this single policy that has seen that window violated up to 19.8 trillion naira, when by law. That, based on the fact that Nigeria's GDP is somewhere around 430 billion US dollars, and 5% of that GDP is somewhere around 21.5 billion dollars, yeah? And the central bank should not have borrowed the government more than 8.5 trillion naira, but has indeed gone and borrowed in excess of 10 trillion naira to the federal government. The governor of the central bank has basically cost inflation. Because when you have too much capital, and, and you see, this, I have listened to a lot of government people defend the government on this. They give an excuse and say, the reason why inflation has gone up is because of Russia and Ukraine, the situation in the Baltics. I beg to defer. Before Russia and Ukraine started on the 28th of February, 2022, Nigeria had double digit inflation. When Governor Sanusi Lamino Sanusi left the central bank as the governor of the central bank, inflation was 7.8%. So the government of the Central Bank of Nigeria cannot give an excuse or excuse himself for 
allowing the waste and means lending to be violated, number one, and saying that it was because of Russia and Ukraine. This is an issue that has caused serious dislocation in our um, 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 uh, fiscal um, uh, policy and framework. Number two, you have a situation where the governor of the central bank has refused to realize that because of the crunch in supply of FX, which is occasioned by the fact that you don't have a converging rates, eh? you don't have a forward market that market makers can supply with liquidity because they don't have forward guidance on where the markets are going. Number, th number three, you have you've had a dwindling of royalties from NMPC for his PSC because Nigeria is unable to meet up with his uh, quotas given by OPEC and you have crude oil theft, yeah? And you've had reduced um, remittances into Nigeria, which are the source of your supply for FX. The Naira has suffered a drop. What is the solution? I move from I'm, I'm working on a fixed peg, a fixed exchange regime where there is a huge discount between the official markets and the parallel markets, and companies are unable to plan because in 12 months, companies are sitting in board meetings and they're asking themselves, they don't know where these markets are going. How are they, how are they going to plan? How are they going to be able to plan for purchase of raw materials? A company, for example, wants to import $5 million worth of equipment to set up a factory that will process uh, animal feeds. And it's not able to plan on what the exchange rate to be 12 months from today. A forward market, for example, will say, okay, you know what? If we're unable to determine what the exchange rate will be, we'll go to the market and buy a premium. It's like insurance. It's like you have insurance. We'll go to the market and buy a premium with 5% of what the equipment will cost. So say 5% is $250,000. We'll place $250,000 in the forward markets as a premium to hedge, to lock in the price and say, in 12 months' time, if so so happens to the market, you will not give us FX at more than this price because we've given you a premium to hedge the price. The market makers who are supposed to provide liquidity to be able to make this contract work in an FX market are, are unable and unwilling to do so because they don't know where the markets are going themselves. So they're not able to take the other part of the counterpart risk. This is all because of a policy dislocation from ways and means lending that has caused inflation in the market to the fact that we've had reduced FX for NMPC because the government has been unwilling, lacks the political will, to ensure that crude oil theft in the Niger Delta is stopped and Nigeria is able to exceed its quota that is given by it, given to it by OPEC. These are the issues. I'm happy you 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 went that route uh, because I was I was asking myself: Is the CBN governor and uh, are the monetary policies uh, the only concerns to? Uh, the FX challenges that we're having in Nigeria. I'm happy you've gone through all the routes. You talked about government's um, commitment to curbing um, oil theft. You talked about uh, non-remittance by the NNPC uh, and, and all of that. Uh, but then I'm also more particular about um, the real sector and how it can contribute. Uh, uh, the real sector's contribution to uh, this entire conversation uh, we have seen the um, diaspora remittance drop uh, uh, in Abismali. It has dropped Abismali. I mean, it has dropped worrisomely, I must say. Uh, and then you begin to wonder why do we have that? We have seen FDIs. We've seen um, uh, portfolio investors. We've seen them elope uh, from our client, singularly because it is not um, a good business environment. Let's begin to highlight how we can deal with these concerns. First and foremost is the environment, uh, what we need to be doing, ensuring that we can attract investors, because that is also a form of, um, of, of um, FX earnings for Nigeria, foreign direct investors into our economy. Let's look at the business environment. What should we be doing as a, as a country in terms of policy, in terms of fiscal and monetary policies that could encourage foreign direct investments? Look, um, so say, for example, the vice president's office is watching this and they are saying to themselves, oh, presidential ease of doing business, payback. Yeah? And they are saying, oh, we're going to provide you with this and that concessions and that as a, way to, as a means to be able to lure investors to come in. Okay, I'll give you an example. Um, 
Mr. Olamile Adebite, who is the Honorable Minister of uh, Mines and Steel, um, gave an interview where he mentioned that he was in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia for a conference. And one of the senior executives at Tesla who was at the event had approached him and said that um, they were considering coming to Nigeria to ask for lithium iron ore, which is one of the major components used for making electric vehicle batteries. And when you consider the fact that the world is gradually, over the next 30 years, trans transitioning to uh, renewable energy, even for cars, from fuel combustion engines, Tesla is a very critical company in the global scheme of things. Now, the minister said that, of course, he turned down their, their request. Okay? And so, for example, if you want Tesla, if, for example, he says that he wants Tesla, he invites Tesla for a meeting to Abuja, and he says he wants them to come and establish a giga factory, a battery factory, which they've established in some parts of the world. They have, I think they have one in China, they have one in, in Berlin, in Germany, and they are looking at expanding their distance. Nigeria is going to be critical, yeah? The question the Tesla board, especially the treasury of Tesla, is going to ask the minister's team in that meeting is, what is the forward policy guidance of the Central Bank of Nigeria as regards the extreme rates. If we bring in $5 billion into Nigeria to establish a giga factory, what's the guarantee that in three to five years time when we want to repatriate profits, if we get our certificate of capital imports at 430 naira per, per US dollar, what's the guarantee that in five years time when we want to repatriate profits, we will have the exchange rate at somewhere between 430 and 450? I assure you the Minister of Mines and still will be unable to answer that question. He won't be able to answer because, first of all, the central bank governor is the one that is in position to answer that question. And going by the situation we have right now in Nigeria, he doesn't have a forward guidance himself. So the solution to attracting investors, which is the most critical, is not in giving them tax waivers, import duty exemption certificates, pioneer status based on National Industrial Tax Relief Act of 2011 as amended in 2014. That's not the solution. Those are incentives that work. It's not in, even in export expansion grants and telling Tesla that, you know what, if you establish a giga factory in Nigeria, you have the whole Africa as your footstool and you'll be able to export. And when you export, the NEPC will give you export expansion grants as promissory notes. That's the solution. Those are fringe incentives. Those incentives are important, but they are not the main consideration. Because the, the Treasury of Tesla will be asking themselves, like, when we calculate in line Treasury, there's what they call the yield curve that calculates the ratio between the um, um, exchange rate, which is an external risk, and inflation, which is an external risk, to the internal rate of return. When they are not able to get a, a true, a favorable yield, a, a favorable curve in that yield that, that helps them to be able to hedge their risk, the companies will not bring in serious dollars into Nigeria. And I can assure you, if you speak to multinational companies and institutional investors, they will tell you that this thing I mentioned is a singular reason why the Nigerian government has been has, has not seen FDI flows increase, and instead it has seen the flows of FDI drop below a billion dollars over the last seven years. This is a singular reason. Because there are six major exchange rates in Nigeria. No serious investor will bring in money into Nigeria working with six different exchange rates. They are not able to calculate the price risk. Nobody. So presential ease of doing business is inconsequential if the central bank does not address this issue. I'm glad you mentioned the issue of the FDI right now. Uh, aside from um, um, the ease of doing business policy that's been created by, uh, by the government, uh, I did hear of uh, a particular um, a manufacturing company that started to come, you know, uh, I think it was specifically Zamfara State, one of the northern states, you know, to just build a huge manufacturing hub, you know, to create a um, uh, manufactured tomato uh, paste. And bandits came in and dealt with them seriously. And that's why it was shut down. And the, the manufacturer has never, ever again come to Nigeria to do anything. I mean, doing elsewhere, in, doing something similar in Ghana, and he's doing so well. And I wonder what, what to take on is how security is playing a huge role on the negative, you know, a negative side to so chasing away uh, FDI from Nigeria. Well, security, security is, a, is, a, is a number one consideration really for, uh, um, com for companies, foreign companies 
And this is, this is because perception is very important and the reality on ground is also very important. And beyond the perception of Nigeria being on the brink of chaos, right? And the Northwest and North Central being very volatile, there is also the issue that we have to realize that Okay, we are hoping um, we can have Kelvin back. Somewhere between 50 and 60 pounds. Okay. Kevin, Perception you... of FDI is coming into Nigeria. Go ahead, we lost you a while ago. Yeah. yeah, so go ahead. Okay, go ahead. I said not only does it affect the perception of companies coming into Nigeria, the insecurity in the Northwest and the North Central has impacted on the primary production of commodities, agricultural commodities that manufacturers need to be able to process food in Nigeria. And I can mention like five different areas that's impacted. I'll, I'll give you an example. Typically, the fact that we've had a 320% rise in the price of uh, animal feeds, poultry feeds that has impacted the price of the chicken and eggs you buy every day can be traced back to the fact that Nigeria currently consumes 16 million metric tons of maize every year. Nigeria produces 11.5 million metric tons of maize every year. Nigeria has a deficit of 4.5 million metric tons of maize every year. The president of Nigeria asked the government to ban the importation of maize and gave an, a waiver to only five companies. These five companies are unable to import maize to equalize the deficit Nigeria has because maize is 54% the formula composition for making animal poultry feeds. They are able to import it because of the exchange rates and shipping charges. Now, the farmers in Nigeria are unable to step up to cover that deficit because a lot of them in the North Central and in the Northwest have run away from their farms because of bandits. You see how interconnected they are. And this has led to the increase across board in food inflation. Food inflation is 22.02%. I expect that before the end of the year, 2022, we're going to see food inflation at 25%. These are the issues. Very, very good to the ear. Uh, food inflation at 25%. Maybe by then, uh, core inflation would have also crossed, crossed the 20% uh, the 20, the 20 threshold, which would be very, very, really very sad. But then, uh, let's let's look at we, we need to begin to prefer solutions here we need to look at how we can deal with this uh, uh, what what would you think that the central bank is not doing that it should be doing uh, I, i'm not saying that they are the only reasons for what we have in terms of fs scarcity but then let's start with that they are the money managers as far as i'm concerned uh, they are the fx managers Let's start with them. What, should, what would you think that a central banker should do, no matter how drastic it, it could come? We have seen them place a ban on some um, imported items um, in the last few, few years. 41, the numbers kept going up, but that has not even helped, helped the situation. What do you think they should be doing, Kevin? First of all, I... I, I believe the single most important decision that the governor of the central bank can make, which is something that should have been done, is change the model for the exchange rate mechanism you have in Nigeria from a fixed peg to a floating exchange rate model. If you do that automatically, you, you collapse all six exchange rates into one. That is going to give the market confidence and is going to unbundle the risk that multinational companies and institutional investors have for bringing capital in Nigeria to Nigeria. Automatically, you see the FDIs begin to creep back, back up. If you collapse the exchange rate by adopting a floating rate mechanism, you have one rate. There will be no 420 and 425 and 430 and 460 and 478 or 480 and then 690. There will be one exchange rate. With that, companies who want to come into Nigeria will be able to price risk. Number two, the central bank governor needs to pivot away from 
This policy, where they have 97.4% uh, of Nigeria's foreign reserves with the US Federal Reserve. Considering that the level of trade between Nigeria and the United States is only 11% of its imports. Nigeria has $65 billion import bill every year. America controls 11% at $5.4 billion. China controls 26% of that, of that import. The question I keep asking is how do you have 97.4% of your foreign reserves with the US government, the US Federal Reserve, when you have only 11.9% 11, uh, 11, 11, 11 of trade with the US? The, the, the Central Bank of Nigeria needs to move at least 50% of its foreign reserves to the People's Bank of China. Israel did, did it recently, a few months ago. They moved $206 billion of their foreign reserves away from the US Federal Reserve to, to the People's Bank of China. When you do that, the central bank governor will be able to revive the Naira Yuan swap, which was signed in 2018 April. That you need to back liquidity for settling Naira versus Yuan trades. If a lot of Nigerians trade with China, why will a Nigerian businessman need to convert $200,000 to um, 200,000 um, 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 Naira's worth of US dollars to US dollars for him to be able to trade in China? It doesn't make any sense. You reduce the dependence on the US dollar and you increase the flow of transactions between the Naira and Yuan, and it will reduce the pressure you have on the Naira. Number two. Number three, and this is where the fiscal authorities come into play. The central bank governor needs to stop playing God. He needs to realize that having direct intervention model for especially agriculture and manufacturing is not the key to unlocking credits. The solution is to bring participation between the Development Finance Department of the Central Bank, which is managed by um, NISA and Bank of Industry, and the, 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 uh, the participating banks, the financial institutions, and have the credit guarantee companies, the CGCs, as a bridge between the central bank and, and the participating banks, so that the central bank will stop assuming all the risk for impairments, for giving loans to the private sector, which is what it has always done. And we can see that the exposure so far is 1.4 trillion naira, and the loan impairment uh, um, um, on the balance sheet of the central bank is, is in double digits, it's over, it's over 400 billion naira. How do you explain to a credit rating institution, for example, that the Central Bank of Nigeria has a loan impairment when the Central Bank is not designed as a money lending institution? It's only designed as a lender of last resort to the federal government of Nigeria. What do you think will happen to the, to the, to the credit rating of Nigeria, which is currently at, at the B, B, BA3, plus, BA3, if I'm not mistaken, and it's in the lower grade? And it has seen us um, um, come down to uh, come up to giving giving uh, uh, coupons on, uh, on government bonds to uh, at about 12.75% for the, this Q3 of 2022 for bonds the DMO is issuing. These are the three core areas I think the government can tackle that will see the economy begin to rebalance and get some stability. Kevin, I mean, thank you so much for this recommendation. But I wonder what's your thoughts uh, about the CBN's RT200 FX program and how much you think that can, you know, help, you know, sort this issue that we, that's bothering Nigerians today. The reality is that companies divert NXP proceeds to foreign accounts and no amount of incentive of, oh, we'll give you one for four or five for one or 10 for one will make these companies to comply. So, for example, it, 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 this boils down to what we've, 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 we've been saying over the last uh, 30 minutes. The solution is not to give more incentives with RUT 200. That's not the solution to the problem. The way to get the companies to bring in their NXP proceeds into Nigeria is ensure that they can have a convergence of rates and they can price risk. Because you have a situation where, I'll, I'll give a typical example. The company brings in its NSP proceeds into Nigeria, and at the investor and exporter dealer window, they trade at 478 or 480. When the company needs to buy raw materials to produce for the next financial year, or they need to buy capital um, equipment, what do they do? They go to the black market because the CBN is unable to provide them with from M. 
What do you think they'll do the next time? They'll divert the NSP proceeds to foreign accounts. So no, no amount of incentive can solve a dislocation that is caused by multiple exchange rates. The, the solution to the problem is convergence. And the only way you can converge it is to change your extra, exchange rate mechanism from a fixed peg to a floating exchange rate model. How do you think the Naira would react to an, um, a floating exchange rate uh, model? How do you think the Naira will react? At first, there will be pressure on it. At first, there will be pressure on it. But given that Dangote refinery is going to come on stream and his daily production of 650,000 barrels a day, converting to uh, PMS, which is 43% of the 179 liters of derivatives that is gotten from one barrel of crude oil, yeah? And given that he's going to be solving somewhere between 75 and 80 percent of Nigeria's PMS needs, which in my estimation is between 48 million and 52 million liters of PMS daily, yeah, Dangote is going to save Nigeria about eight billion dollars every year in PMS imports. If Dangote does that, you will see that the pressure to sell the naira on a free fall when the central bank, for example, model and I allow Naira to float will be reduced. So at first you're going to see the Naira drop significantly to somewhere between 800, 850 and 900. But as the government begins to take advantage of the um, backward integration that Dangote is doing with his refinery and as the fiscal authorities begins to do backward integration for areas like his national sugar master plan, dairy, um, 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 and, 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 other, and other areas, and other areas that has the food import bill, for example, last $12 billion. If, if you can do like 50% backward integration for his food import bill and, and reduce his level of um, um, exposure by 15 to $20 billion, yeah, you're going to see that that true price discovery is going to come back down to somewhere around 550 and 600 and stabilize at that level. And the importance of stability and having one exchange rate at that band is that you see the economy begin to unbundle and companies begin to bring in FDIs, liquidity. And because it's a, it's a free float, it's not a peg, the better Nigeria performs with its balance of trade and its current accounts status, yeah, the stronger the Naira becomes. Then the fiscal authorities like the Minister of Finance and the Minister of Budget and Economic Planning now have to sit down and decide in its medium-term and long-term economic framework official strategy paper. Number one, what is our strategy? Do we want to switch from a debt strategy as a means to funding the budget to a revenue strategy, which is your revenue to GDP ratio? Yeah? And number two, do we want to create an import-driven economy or an export-driven economy, given that a weak currency favors exports and a strong currency favors imports? So what strategy do you want to create? Every major economy in the world, if you watch it, watch the 10 top economies in the world, they have a strategy. Some countries devalue their currency deliberately. For example, the South Korean one, you have a weak one, the Japanese yen, you have a weak yen because when you look at the balance of trade, Japan and South Korea are some of the major export hubs in the world. For everything from electronics to heavy industries to cars. So what, what is our strategy as a country? As we speak right now, the Nigerian government does not have a strategy. It doesn't know what, what it wants to do. It doesn't have a direction. Is it an import driven strategy or is it an export driven strategy? That will inform the kind of exchange rates uh, mechanism you want. And where in its true price discovery, you will want that rate to stabilize at. I think um, uh, could be more appropriate at this point in time, looking at uh, the fundamentals. Uh, Within the Nigerian economy, very weak fundamentals. So, should we should we decide to be an export? Uh, uh, should we strategize based on exports? We don't have the fundamentals to propel an export-driven economy. Yes, we don't. We don't have the fundamentals to propel an export, 
driven economy because most of the manufacturing that is done, consumer manufacturing that is done in Nigeria relies on raw materials that are gotten from other parts of the world. And the reason why you've seen inflation is because the Naira has dropped and the cost of bringing these raw materials into Nigeria has increased. So when these consumer manufacturers eventually get the raw materials to produce, they jack up the cost. The way to address that problem is what they call import substitution through backward integration. And you have to focus on the areas where Nigeria has a comparative advantage. And this is the work of the government, the fiscal authorities, the Minister of Industry, Trade and Investment, the Minister of Solid Minerals, Mines and Steel, the Minister of Finance, Budget and National Planning. This is the work of the fiscal authorities. This is why they have a job. What are some of these sectors that can give Nigeria that comparative advantage? I would say, for example, we have a comparative advantage with solid minerals. We can focus on lithium, cobalt, we already have uh, the cement industry developed. We have a comparative advantage in agriculture and manufacturing, uh, food processing. We can focus on uh, the commodities that we have. For example, if you look at the 10 commodities, uh, the, the, the government is celebrating the fact that it has export revenue, NXP proceeds from agricultural commodities, raw material that it exports at 550 billion naira, for example. That's a billion dollars. That's poor performance. Nigerian government cannot celebrate $1 billion in revenue from exporting agricultural commodities. Nigeria should compare itself to the Netherlands. So for shear, for system seeds, for millet, for rice, yeah, for cocoa, that Nigeria is the third largest uh, producer of, has the third largest output of, Nigeria government cannot celebrate $1 billion in export revenue. It's poor performance. Nigeria has comparative advantage with oil, with gas. And when it comes to crude oil, for example, look, look let me, hear me out. Against the popular belief, PMS, AGO or diesel, dual purpose kerosene, DPK, aviation fuel, jet A1, are not the only derivatives from refining crude oil. There's liquefied refinery gas, which is the equivalent of LPG or your cooking gas or your coolants. Yeah, there is bitumen binders or asphalt. There is pet coke using producing the aluminium cans that you use for your canned drinks and aluminium roofs. There is marine fuel or heavy oil that ships use to sell. Those are derivatives of refining crude oil. Those are derivatives of refining crude oil that Nigeria has not profited from from doing direct sales and direct purchase agreement with foreign refineries because the Nigerian government has not been completely transparent and honest with the Nigerian people. Kevin, I'm looking at the fundamentals. As, as you're talking, I'm, I'm thinking. It's, it's, it's like we're, we're going in circles here. We seem to be going in circles here. You mentioned the manufacturing sector as an advantage, uh, but then it is bedeviled by loads of challenges uh, right now. Uh, do you think, do you see a need do you see a need um, in closing, Kevin? Do you see a need to begin to restart this, this, this state called Nigeria? Let's begin to restart it on all, on all fronts, on all fundamentals. To be honest with you, the, the task for the next Nigerian president, I listened to the presidential candidate speak at the NBA conference in Lagos uh, two days ago, two or three days ago. The number one task of the next Nigerian president is to ensure that there is restructuring and there's official federalism. We have to move from this model where we have revenue sharing based on equity of state, land mass, population, IGR, and derivation to states and what the states can do for themselves. The states have to compete. The reality is that some states are going to do better than others. Lagos, for example, has the highest IGR in Nigeria. You can't do anything about that. Kaduna, River States, Akwaibom, Cross River States, Delta states, Oshun states, they have to come back up. And the way for them, for them to come back up is, for, is by ensuring that we look at that exclusive legislative list and take away most of the items from that list to the concurrent list and the residual list to see that the states and local governments 
I control local states, for example, and control of their resources. And federal government is only a regulator. And the states pay back royalties to the center. This, this model we currently have where the federal government gets 54% or 55%, the states gets 29% based on the metrics I just mentioned, uh, the Revenue Mobilization and Future Allocation Commission that controls the FAC, is wrong. Because what you have is you're saying, no matter the performance of individual states, we're going to share the revenues equally to all the states, except the states that have 13% derivation. There's dislocation. There's already official dislocation. So the number one task that the next Nigerian president needs to be able to unlock productivity, considering that Osho State has 2 million ounces of gold, for example, and can develop IGR that will compete with Lagos. Yes? Is to ensure that there's official federalism. And you change the principles of derivation from population, landmass, IGR, yeah, equity of states and derivation to the concurrent list where the states control their resources and pay revenues, royalties back to the center. Fantastic, Alvin. Fantastic um, conversation we're having. I, I really wish we have more time uh, to stay on this matter. Uh, yes, I know you're an economist, but I think um, you seem to understand the workings of, um, of government and um, true federalism and restructuring. You seem to have an understanding around uh, this conversation. We need to bring you back, Alvin. Uh, we have not scratched the conversation. There is still so much we can talk about. You're always here with us, no doubt. But we'll bring you back again uh, sometime soon. Kevin Emanuel, thank you for your time and thoughts on the show. Uh, good morning. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. All right, Messi. This that, is that, where that was a thirty-something minute <laughs> masterclass there. On FX. So, so people who really don't understand what's going on, why the reason why that only on a tomato is expensive, mm. would definitely understand, understand that better fundamentals. Now. There, it, it, it's not just um, uh, that dollar is high. We now understand the reasons. We now understand the concerns. There are so many didn't mention, which I wanted to remind him: the sabotage, mm. um, uh, the all called sabotage, and, uh, and uh, within the FX regime. But then that will be a for conversation. Thank you everyone. Thank you our viewers. Thank you our guests and um, uh, those that attempted to call on the show. We appreciate you and we say it's been a wonderful two hours fifty minutes with you this morning. We'll do this again tomorrow at God willing. I am David Ubabudike. Have a great Thursday. Absolutely. Have a fantastic Thursday too. My name is Mercy Frank. Vote wisely. <laughs>